We'll be leaving time for questions at, at, at towards the end, but a couple of quick points. First, we've already received many questions from participants that were sent in early. Second, there are almost 500 registrants. Uh, by the way, many very senior leaders from across government, military, academia, nonprofit, and industry, in addition to cadets and midshipmen from the military academies. And while we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible, we apologize up front if we don't get to yours. Uh, third, we have a team of folks who are screening incoming questions and they'll pass them on to me. It'd be helpful if you could identify yourself. You can remain anonymous if you choose. It'll also help if you identify to whom on the panel you're addressing your question. And then finally, a 14 part question isn't fair, so please try to be succinct. We thank you all again for joining and I'm honored to introduce the CEO and Chairman of Palo Alto Networks, Nikesh Aurora. Good morning everyone and thank you very much for um, joining us. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, we have so many flag and general officers in one place for a discussion. And I'm delighted that uh, we have the opportunity of co-hosting this with uh, Superintendent Jay. Um, if my father was with us, he'd be very proud. Uh, my father retired uh, as the Judge Advocate General of the Indian Air Force. So I grew up in a family where we had to put mission and country above all else. And, and it's a real honor to be with all of you today. Um, as we all know, these are extraordinary times. And we have real opportunity during the extraordinary times to figure out how to take things forward. We're all dealing not just with the pandemic, but we're also dealing with the national and international re-examination of race and social injustice. Um, these events today have the opportunity of changing how we think about ourselves as society and how we think about everything that happens around us. Now, we at Palo Alto Networks, uh, our 8,000 strong people, are undergoing some of the same trials and tribulations and challenges as many, many, many people around the world. Um, and we've really had to focus in the last three to four months around what's right for our employees, what's right for our company, as well as what's right for our customers and what's right uh, for their employees. And I'm delighted to say that our teams have really rallied hard to make sure they've been there for our customers, they've been there for them when they need them the most. Uh, our biggest challenge in the pandemic has been making sure our, our employees are safe and they're able to go provide the services that are needed to our customers, where everybody, literally overnight, we saw thousands of our customers with hundreds of thousands of employees wanted to work remotely in a secure way. And our team really rallied to make that happen. We're also seeing major technological changes. We're seeing a large, re, I'd say, re-acceleration of the transition to the cloud across all of our customers. We're seeing a larger examination of how much do we need to be on premise versus how much do we need to have remote capability set up in a secure way for everyone. We're also seeing our employees ask us, can I work from home? Can I do this remotely? Why do I need to show up in some cases eight to five, in some cases seven to seven to the office? How can I do this from home? So there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with both on the technological side as well as the social side as an employer. But you know, I just, Wanted to take the opportunity one more time to thank all of you to come join us. I also wanted to uh, welcome General Jay Silveria, who has been so kind to be our co-host in this process, and his team at the Air Force Academy, who have been a tremendous partner in hosting this summit. And hopefully we'll be able to return to Colorado Springs uh, next spring. Um, and also we have a bunch of uh, distinguished group of DOD members and leaders who will share their insights today on the pandemic impact and its impact on the nation's military and its cyber mission. So with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to General Jay. General Jay, thank you very much once again, and we look forward to hearing your opening remarks. Uh, Nikesh, thank you very much. Thank you for a, a kind introduction and the, the connection to your background, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it really is a pleasure to join everyone that, uh, from across the country that, that has joined in, both from other military academies as well as just uh, out among the enterprise. Uh, we certainly wish we could do this in person. Uh, you know, the value of everyone assembling at the Service Academy can't be uh, uh, understated or can't be really overstated. So, uh, I, you know, we missed that. And so we look forward to getting a chance to, to see everyone uh, once again. Let me thank everyone uh, for participating uh, and investing your time and uh, investing your energy uh, into, into this discussion. Uh, it's pretty unique opportunity when I look down the list of the uh, 
of the three stars here, and uh, I was quick to think and realize that uh, the good news about wearing the label of host is that I'm not going to answer the questions that are going to be the tough questions uh, with this group that's here. So uh, it certainly it certainly is impressive. So thanks to thanks to all of those uh, general officers, flag officers that joined in uh, to do this. Uh, it, it really enriches this conversation. So so thank you very much. Um, I think uh, for uh, for the JSAC, uh, to, for all of us to remember that it just reinforces the importance of that of the Service Academy Summit, in that the Service Academies are so uniquely placed to be at an intersection of higher ed, business, uh, government, uh, and and just industry as as the uh, cyber enterprise continues to advance that the service academies find themselves in a unique juncture of, uh, of all of those elements. So I think this is such an important partnership. It's important for us to continue that cyber dialogue. As Nikesh mentioned, there's, there's so many elements that, that we're all experiencing right now. And I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't remind uh, all of us, and certainly those of us who are in uniform, that some of the societal unrest that we're, that we're experiencing, we, we certainly can't be toned up to it. And it reminds us as warfighters that, uh, that in all things, as we develop these young leaders, uh, that there's a commitment to our values. And the values are that they will lead all and that they will serve all. And, uh, and that's in cyber warfighting as it is in all elements of warfighting. And we're certainly seeing uh, unprecedented change in our country in so many other areas because of the COVID and because of our reaction, not the least of which is that, you know, I'm in my office in my home uh, here uh, as, as we have this event. And it also, it also emphasizes that for us in the national security business, that dealing with change, dealing with this challenge uh, is, is necessary as we accomplish our mission. We do not have the luxury of deciding that this environment or this set of conditions is now too difficult and that we need to wait. Uh, we have to work through this, and whether it's COVID that drives us into a network, whether it's something that fill in the blank drives us into a dispersed nature of operating, then, then whatever that is, we have to have the agility uh, to work through that both in thought and then also in technology. Uh, I, I tell you, as, as, a, as an institution, I wonder, if I had gone to my faculty and I asked them, we need to convert entirely to online, how long, there might be some of my faculty on, I don't know if they're gonna you know, react to this, but how long would it take them? What time frame would they say they would need? And I'm, I can imagine that I would measure that in, in probably in a year or two is what they would say to convert an institution from zero to 100%. They did it in nine days. They did it in nine days. So I think the downside for some of the students, by the way, if there's cadets that are on, they've also made it very clear that there will never be another snow day here in Colorado because we know that we have this capability. So maybe the cadets don't see that uh, certainly as positive. Uh, there's also been some things that, have, that we've experienced lately that I think point uh, directly to the importance of, uh, of our cyber security priorities and the partnerships. And uh, I'll give you an example. The last two days, we've had over, uh, we've had about four brute force attempts uh, at our network from locations. We've had uh, over 30 countries, we've had uh, attempts to get into our network from over 30 countries, uh, from U Ukraine and Germany and Nigeria, uh, from those locations, including New Caledonia, which I have to admit, I had to go to an atlas to figure out where New Caledonia was. But uh, that just shows you that there are people that are always willing and as fast as we expand in our opportunities, they see those as opportunities uh, for our vulnerability. So uh, we've seen that in uh, just in the past few days. We've continued to be more and more dependent on our networks and our communication, and I know we're gonna continue to talk about delivering that to the warfighter. And, uh, and right now, the warfighter is the one trying, it, at the Air Force Academy, is, uh, is trying to get curriculum delivered to, to, this, to someone's parents' basement as we work through that, but it directly recognizes the challenge. Uh, I certainly look forward to the discussion and, and to the events. Uh, and to close, uh, let me thank the, the Palo Alto team 
uh, let me thank uh, John and, and Nikesh uh, for all the work and, uh, and also uh, here, uh, Colonel Caswell from, from our team in the, uh, the computer science at the Air Force Academy for organizing and continue to hold these partnerships together through this time. It's an amazing opportunity for all of us. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, General. Uh, your advocacy, as, as well as that of your team, uh, has been and will continue to be critical to our cause. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce our distinguished leaders for today's discussion. Uh, once I introduce them all, I'll turn over the floor to each of them uh, for opening comments. First, we have Vice Admiral Nancy Norton, uh, Director of the Defense Information Systems Agency, or DISA, and Commander of uh, Joint Force Headquarters for the Department of Defense Information Network. Next, we have Lieutenant General B.J. Schwedo, Director of Command Control Communications and Computer Slash Cyber, and Chief Information Officer for the Joint Staff. We also have Lieutenant General Bruce Crawford, Chief Information Officer and G6, Headquarters Department of the Army. Additionally, we have Lieutenant General Mary O'Brien, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance, and Cyber Effects Operations, Headquarters U.S. Air Force. And finally, we have Vice Admiral T.J. White, Commander U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and U.S. 10th Fleet. These are all some of our senior most military leaders across both the service and joint levels of the U.S. military when it comes to the cyber domain. I'm truly honored to know each of them and call them respected teammates in the broader sense of defending the digital way of life that we all increasingly depend on. We'll get start, uh, we will start with opening comments from General Schwedo since uh, he's got to take off for a meeting in the tank in a few minutes. We hope he'll be able to rejoin once he returns. BJ, I can honestly say I don't miss those tank meetings, so good luck and over to you, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. And thank you, Nikash, and thank you, uh, General Severi. I really appreciate the opportunity, and more importantly, your uh, sense of humor with my schedule. Due to classification sensitivities, there couldn't be any substitution, so I apologize. Uh, more importantly, for the uh, cadets and midshipmen, I remember thinking, if I ever become a general, I'll be able to do whatever I want. For your future, not so much. Uh, you, you get told where to be often, and um, really, I'm psyched to be here. I appreciate it. Um, staying with the focus on the cadets and midshipmen, this is really important because you guys are our future. And most importantly, unlike most domains of warfare, air, land, sea, space, you'll be able to, in cyber, make instantaneous impacts. Uh, for example, the last time I was with General Severia, I had the honor to go to the White House and witness Cadet First Class Sears Schultz from USAFA receive the Presidential Cup. And in this scenario, he got to be a global defender against hackers, and he got first place, not in the collegiate level. He got first uh, place across all of government against a thousand other defenders. So the bottom line is, the expectation is as soon as you hit the floor running, we expect you to make that instantaneous impact. But I'm not the only person that has found in the cyber realm the talent that we have. On Wednesday, I had a meeting with my German counterpart from the Ministry of Defense, and he was amazed at one of the apps that was made by one of his people. And I said that I had similar experiences with our airmen, soldiers, sailors, space for pro professionals, and Marines. And now I'll share with you my observations and requests. I told this German three-star, I found when it comes to cyber, the very top and the very low get it. It's the curmudgeons in between that are the problem children. And my request to the leadership is we need to hunt these guys down either for education or elimination. For the younger folks, continue to push the attack. Don't get discouraged because we need you in this fight. Next, for industry, thank you so much. You ensure our national security and our future will be more dependent on your efforts as we go forward with this great power competition focused on China and Russia. Unfortunately, there will no longer be demarcation lines between acquisition and the military. You are in the foxhole with us. The days of shrink wrap and disks are gone, and we're going to have to accept measured risks and instantaneous updates from your capabilities. Now, when it comes to COVID re response, you absolutely have the right crowd to tell the story. 
you're going to hear amazing stories about 3.25 million accounts, $300 million of dispersals, and unbelievable timelines. But before we go further, I really would like to highlight the efforts of Dana Deasy. He's the OSD Chief Information Officer, as he often did cat herding for all of this large team as we attacked on all fronts. When it first came to this situation, the first thing that broke into my mind was never let a serious crisis go to waste. It provides the opportunity to do things that were not possible before. And in this scenario, quite frankly, funding and emphasis of all of these items were always in our cross check, but in the battle for finite resources, they never made it above the cut line, except in a crisis. Another piece was the active uh, activities to implement quick solutions. We rapidly implemented them due to the efforts, and I applaud the efforts of NSA and DISA to make quick assessments and ensure security as we went forward. Lastly, back to the cadets and midshipmen. This is a great example of the situations you'll find yourself in the future. The good news is you'll have help, a lot like this forum from industry, academia, and government. There'll be no dearth of opinions, and many will paint very bad pictures of your current situation. But you must remember, with great challenges, there's great opportunities. In this case, there were many concerns and worries about an underinformed workforce who would be doing net defense from their home living rooms, a great challenge. But through lots of education of handouts, websites, and training manuals, we found that we raised the knowledge of our workforce, great opportunity. Another pace was, many people rightly pointed out with this expanded telework, we would greatly increase the attack access of our, for our competitors. Great challenge. But there's an old saying that says, the thief will not come in the night when you know that we're waiting. Well, guess what? We knew they were coming. And this afforded us lots of capabilities for new uh, defensive TTPs and knowing and studying our adversaries. Last, we had to introduce new untested solutions, a great challenge. But with all of these discussions about JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, these untested capabilities that were a challenge now are a great opportunity for us in the future. So for the cadets and midshipmen, remember our job is to manage risk. You'll have help like this forum, but all your schooling experience and expertise will give you the judgment to make well-informed decisions as we keep our families safe. And you'll find these situations will come sooner rather than later. So take copious notes and get ready. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm gonna do everything I can to get back, but thanks. Thanks, General. Uh, great comments. Uh, General Bruce Crawford. Uh, General, the floor is yours. We got you, Bruce. We got you, Bruce. All right, good. Well, well listen, the first thing I wanted to do in int interest of time here, uh, I just wanna take the opportunity up front to thank, uh, thank Nikesh, uh, Jay, and uh, again, John, old friend, it's, it's always good to, good, to, good to see you again. Uh, for both the invitation, but more importantly, uh, for this investment in our next greatest generation of leaders and creating an opportunity to share with them. I can think of no more important job uh, that I have uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and, uh, and I know I can speak for my teammates here, than investing in the next uh, greatest generation of leaders. Uh, so Nikesh mentioned something, and uh, I, I just wanted to highlight that. He talked about the fact uh, that this really is a seminal moment. And so uh, just a message to our cadets and midshipmen uh, that are out there, uh, it's uh, just kind of one big idea. And that one big idea is this really is your time. Uh, seize the moment uh, and, and make a difference. Uh, in time of crisis, and uh, there are many of my teammates out there that have been through many, many uh, different variations of crisis, uh, but the supporting piece to that message to the midshipmen and cadets is there absolutely is no substitute for leadership uh, in time of crisis. Uh, to our industry partners, I've never been prouder uh, of you uh, as uh, during the seven or eight years or so that I've been a general officer, than watching you respond in support of this particular crisis, making sure that we really understood the art of the possible when it came to leverage our ability to leverage technology uh, to move the department forward and support the nation. So very quickly, when it comes to the Army, uh, I will tell you that uh, so you can go back pre-COVID, and I know it's discussions about COVID, 
But, uh, you know, we've been uh, responding. Uh, it actually goes back to New Year's Eve. Uh, when no notice uh, on New Year's Eve, the Army was called upon to deploy, no notice, a brigade combat team out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, to Southwest Asia. And that was a flawless oper operation in support of the nation. But immediately following that, uh, my hat's off to not only Dana Deasy for pulling together uh, the COVID task force. And there's a lot of learning that we'll, and we'll talk about, some of those lessons uh, that we learn. But my hat's also off to the Army leadership, to Secretary McCarthy uh, and to General James McConville, the 40th Chief Staff of the Army, because early on, uh, they made some hard decisions. And at that time, those weren't very popular decisions across the department in terms of posturing the Army, uh, knowing that the Army was going to eventually get a call uh, to support the nation. And so they made those decisions very early on. And they highlighted, uh, we had our stated priorities for the Army, but they modified those priorities on the fly. And those priorities were, number one, and this was mentioned earlier on the importance of taking care of our people, but we had to protect the force. Uh, number two, uh, given what we did on New Year's Eve, we knew that we had, uh, opportun I'll call them opportunistic peer adversaries that are out there. So we had to maintain uh, a readiness footing. Uh, and number three, we had to be ready when that call came uh, to support the nation. So that was all about supporting the whole of nation effort. And then the last thing was while we were doing that, we had to, given the amount of resources that we put into modernization, the Army actually had to retain the ability uh, to build the future force uh, as we move towards this multi-domain and joint all-domain uh, operation. Uh, and so... Uh, in terms of things to think about, uh, that, that we'll, we'll have some conversations here, and I'll get off stage. So there's lots of energy behind this idea of the new normal. Uh, I would argue, uh, having been in the Pentagon on 9-11, like probably many of you, um, I think it's more a new now than it is a new normal. And uh, so uh, as we look forward, uh, so new normal is kind of what we did after 9-11. On the next day, there were some things that we have adopted and we still do today. But back to this idea that this is a seminal moment, this is different. Uh, it's almost, we're almost at a place where think about where we were two weeks ago and then think about what we've done over the next two, over the last two weeks. So it's this idea, I, I think in terms of the new normal vote price, new now, it's going to come down to one of two things. Are we just going to take the things that we did before the crisis? and just do those things differently? Or are there gonna be new things uh, that we're going to do? Uh, I, I think it's gonna be a combination of that. Uh, probably a, a third option is, is gonna be both. That's gonna inform uh, this idea of, of new normal or new now. But the reason I make the statement that it's more about the new now uh, is because we don't know what the next week holds, what the next two week holds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's likely going to be more of a cascading series of future states that we're going to deal with vice this, okay, we're done, and this is how we're going to do business for the foreseeable future. So let's offer that as one of the think pieces. The second think piece has to do with what I've seen in terms of just here in the Pentagon. We went from probably 1% of the workforce teleworking to overnight 90% of the workforce teleworking. And so I've seen a cultural change with respect to the acceptance of the virtual space as normal. Uh, I think there's gonna come a day when there is no such thing as telework. It's only gonna be working. And I think culturally and institutionally, we will accept that as the way of doing business without blinking on that. Uh, and then the last thing that I tell you is, and it was mentioned earlier, but I think the COVID environment actually created some unprecedented opportunities for us to actually accelerate uh, ideas and big ideas that we already had on the conveyor belt. Uh, but to Jay's point, probably would have taken one to two years for us to actually complete. And so I look forward to a great discussion today. And again, uh, to the team, uh, good, good on you uh, for pulling this, uh, this group together. Uh, that's all I have in terms of opening comments. And again, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, I happen to agree with you in terms of the role that change plays in our environment, and it's only magnified by this thing that we call cyberspace. Uh, now we're going to hear from General O'Brien. Mary, over to you, General. 
Well, hello. Um, let me echo the thanks uh, to Palo Alto and the Air Force Academy uh, for all the effort that went in to coordinate this, uh, working through all our schedules, um, and putting this event together after the April event was canceled. Uh, I'm actually really disappointed that we weren't out in Colorado in April. I was looking forward to talking to cadets and uh, was intending to recruit a, fruit, a few. Uh, as they're all thinking about their future career fields, and uh, I wanted to make sure they knew, and, and I know that there's multiple cadets out there today because I did control F on the spreadsheet and I found you. Uh, there is a place for you in our Air Force Cyber Enterprise. Um, but since that isn't happening today, uh, and I'm not out there, I, I will invite you to reach out to me uh, if you're interested in cyber or the ISR career fields with questions about what it's like to be starting out as a young officer in the Air Force in these career fields today at any time. Uh, I'm in the global, you can find me, and cadets are very resourceful. Um, so I'll try to answer these questions, uh, but keep in mind, the Air Force was issuing Z248 computers with five inch floppy drives when I graduated. Um, so fortunately, I have access to hundreds of lieutenants and captains uh, who can tell you what it's like today to be starting out um, and what is it like in you know, a modern day perspective to be in this career field today. They're doing things today that we only saw in science fiction movies when I was lieutenant starting out. It is really amazing. <clears throat> so, so I'm the second Air Force A26 after General Golfing directed the headquarters restructure and merged the ISR and the cyber effects operations under Lieutenant General Dash Jameson. Uh, and of course, he kept the CIO role distinct under the Secretary of the Air Force. Uh, and so now as we're moving forward, we're maturing this organization. We're moving past merging and focusing on integration and how do we integrate. We find that our intelligence and cyber roles are focused uh, increasingly interdependent and interconnected. Uh, it is rewarding to be able to encourage and see best practices that are being shared between these two communities that now have a chance to work side by side every day. I see the value of this synergy in many areas all the time, uh, but I'll share three examples with you. Uh, for remote teleworking and defending our networks and power projection platforms overall, bringing the intelligence and cyber experts closer together like we did uh, at the organizational level by combining 24th and 25th Air Force to create 16th Air Force is already delivering positive outcomes. They're identifying the threats and they're posturing to defend against them and this was not always the case. Uh, next, these integration efforts are also providing uh, value in furthering our discussions of information warfare and its role in great power competition. We're looking at both our ISR Next Generation Flight Plan that was signed out by the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief in 2018, and our more recent Cyber Warfare Flight Plan, which was signed out last March, and thinking about how do we bring those together while we implement the different lines of efforts that we developed in there. Uh, lastly, uh, both intelligence and cyber professionals are recognized experts at dealing with data, obtaining data, transporting data, analyzing data, visualizing the data, and fusing the data. Uh, with our chief data officer, we're developing better ways of using data to drive enterprise decision making. Um, I've already had a cadet send me a text. I'm saying friendly, good, good uh, back. And uh, I do look forward to more of our discussion. I think it's gonna be very productive. So thanks again. Thank you, General. And uh, your comment about uh, organizational change. Uh, I mean, my experience is when, you, when you're talking about the word cyber, it's been a constant evolution of organizational change. And I suspect we're not yet where we need to be for the future because it will continue to change. So thank you for your comments. I see that we have Admiral Norton back, so I'm gonna let her finish her opening comments before we go to uh, Admiral White. Thank you, John, sorry about that. The one time that I work from home and, uh, and, and the network at home fails to be. Um, so, you know, as, uh, as we shifted to, um, to this COVID environment, I want to say that as both the commander of Joint Force Headquarters, Doden, and the director of DISA, that I am extremely proud of both of my teams. 
Uh, we never closed. We never stopped working. On the contrary, we ramped up our operations to an amazing pace. Uh, we, we recognized that the work that we do is mission critical, and we um, set about to ensure that the Department of Defense could work from home in a way that they had never done before, that they had never expected to do, just like General Salveri said, you know, nothing, uh, nothing was expected and we were able to do that incredibly fast. And we adjusted our battle rhythm in order to do that, to, um, to enable the department to work from home and to keep our own workforce safe. And uh, we started with uh, understanding uh, from uh, each of the 45 DOD components what their, uh, what their requirements were, for their own mission sets, uh, their operational requirements, uh, understanding the gap assessment of what they actually needed, and then starting to prioritize those requirements and addressing the gaps that they had and uh, in working on, on um, filling each one of those gaps. And um, all doing that without creating additional significant risk in cybersecurity and without increasing significant risk to our own force. So having to do upgrades on our networks, upgrades on, in cybersecurity, uh, and pushing out a lot of information to our users across the board on how to um, uh, properly secure their networks and how to properly operate on their networks. So just to name a few, um, some of the statistics, we provision circuits that increase capacity by over 300 gigabits per second for our nation's warfighters. We help to establish uh, communications capability for the Navy hospital ships in, in New York and California um, for the mercy and the comfort. Uh, we provided uh, circuits for the um, Army hospital um, or Army medical facilities in various areas where they, they uh, set up for supporting COVID-19. Um, we provided uh, additional capacity for virtual private networks um, for remote access for telework capacity in CONUS and OCONUS capability uh, for additional reliability um, for more than 300% using the joint regional security stacks that we already had in place and that were basically uh, almost setting dormant in, in terms of the, the capacity that we had. So um, if you would throw up the slide just to give you a visual of that, we had about 8,000 people that were using these, uh, these VPNs back in the beginning of March. That was steady state. And that grew to a peak of 122,000 people, concurrent users each day uh, in, in May. So that's just one visual of the kinds of things that, that we increased very, very rapidly. You could see that over and over again. You can take that down now. Over and over again, whether that was um, telephony service or bandwidth capacity, um, it, it, it is amazing. And working with the services and the other DOD components, we leverage the expertise and experience of our people around the globe to, uh, to provide the capability that we needed to ensure that the DOD could continue to work and keep our people safe and, and, uh, and healthy. And we've really leveraged years of experience to move towards a more mobile capable workforce where data is accessible anywhere um, during deployment, TDY, or, or while teleworking. This has paid incredible dividends during this crisis. So whether we're confronting a pandemic or enabling combat operations, we're working harder than ever to ensure that our nation maintains a decisive digital edge from the battlefield to the desktop in our own homes. And I wanna say for our, our midshipmen and our cadets that you will, will absolutely be part of the cyber workforce. You are part of operating and defending our cyberspace platforms, regardless of what career field you go into. So um, you need to be thinking about that all of the time. I would love for you to be actually part of, of uh, you know, our um, uh, intimately in our career fields, but regardless of what, what career field you pick, you will be operating and defending our platform. Thank you very much. Thanks, Admiral. Let me just say that I've always had great respect for the challenging operational job that your team has, both at DISA and at JFHQ Doden. Uh, thank you for doing all that hard work. Uh, finally, I'd like to invite Admiral White to provide his remarks before we begin the Q&A portion. TJ, special thanks to you for your help in shaping this important discussion 
and enlisting the participation of our other great leaders today. The floor is yours, Admiral. Hey, uh, John, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, you can dump the photo, that's not very flattering. Um, to Jay and to uh, Palo Alto Networks for uh, your support and advocacy for the JSAC, Nancy, BJ, uh, Bruce, and Mary, it's good to be with you uh, in virtual space. Although, Mary, I didn't think I was old until you mentioned seeing a 348 computer. Uh, I remember that well, unfortunately. Uh, and to all the midshipmen and to uh, the cadets uh, and industry partners uh, that are joining us today. Um, I, I really uh, would just simply observe that today's challenges presented by the pandemic uh, and unfortunately in our nation, the civil unrest which is ongoing, uh, coupled with the revolution in our means of communicating virtually, uh, truly indeed makes this a new point in our history and it's timely that we can have this conversation. Uh, over the past three months, uh, we've seen real-time changes in how we respond to the force health challenge uh, that has been unprecedented in our lifetime. Uh, and as Nancy and others have talked about, the extraordinarily fast and large expansion of our worldwide telework capacity underpinned by what DISA can generate for the force and what industry can help integrate uh, in near real time to the adoption of alternate work schedules impacting our cyber workforce, and to the ever-present need to defend our networks from intrusions. Uh, and unfortunately also with the, uh, as Bruce mentioned, the adversary that will be opportunistic, the need to combat adversary misinformation efforts and COVID-19 related scams. Uh, for those of you, uh, information warfare uh, in our service, in our department is here to stay. And if you choose and have an opportunity to serve uh, in our ranks, uh, I would offer it is the most joints, it is the fastest moving, uh, and it is where, uh, as BJ said, you can have an immediate impact. Uh, I think that our people are our greatest asymmetric advantage in today's great power competition, and it's our ability to attract and retain the best and the brightest personnel that will keep us on firm footing. My counterpart down 16th Air Force, Tim Hawk, uh, I'll steal his line. He talks about the network should be our biggest recruiting and retention tool. And one of the things I think we found is commented with a little bit of the underinvestment profile is that we have a long way to go to find ourselves on par uh, with what I would observe as the conventionally minded maneuver force. Um, but as our country reopens, a large portion of our warfighters will still telework. And as has been observed, it's going to become increasingly normal and normalized uh, and uh, new. And if we face the challenge of keeping our teams united, focused, and committed uh, during these extended periods of uncertainty, that will be difficult. Uh, I also think that we're going to be spending some time thinking about uh, the ongoing and likely second wave of the COVID infections. So we will be uh, challenged with a desire to relax the efficiencies uh, and the new that we have learned and gained and probably uh, fight and claw back uh, to what we used to do. And so this is where, as others have commented, leadership will be so important and vital to success. Uh, I'm struck by a lot of vexing questions as I think about trying to be a leader, a military leader and a national defense and a national security leader. How do we maintain workforce resiliency in a long-term telework environment? How do we build and maintain relationships with our teams? Uh, I grew up thinking about deck plates leaders. Uh, my Army counterpart general would talk about leadership in the foxhole. Uh, the airmen uh, in the Air Force will talk about uh, flight line leadership. So what does that look like in cyberspace? All of that is very tangible and it's very uh, close aboard. Um, how do we replicate the camaraderie of interpersonal communication and spontaneous interactions? How do we maintain force morale when we are trying to do this at a distance because that's a public health environment? How do we how do we keep innovation supercharged and flowing? And how do we collaborate effectively when again, so much uh, as this has been built on personal relationships over time and distance, has talked about all these general officers I've served with personally in the past over the last decade or more. How do we ensure training standards are met? And from a Navy standpoint, I suspect all the services are thinking about this. How do we continue to instill, reinforce, and have confidence 
in our core values from a Navy standpoint of honor, courage, and commitment. And how do you do that over a teleconference? I think uh, I don't have answers to all these questions, uh, but I'm very confident that they will likely be found, uh, as others have pointed out, with our midshipmen and our cadets. Uh, I think that uh, those that are the youngest among us are probably the most facile and easily able to adapt and overcome no matter the adversary uh, and no matter what the challenge. Um, so I would just sort of say in closing, uh, I think the events of 2020 have brought into stark relief our need to integrate the vision to imagine next with an ability and resiliency to handle the next surprise wherever it occurs over the horizon uh, and in possibly uncharted waters. And I think that we need to meet these technology and trust challenges together. I think going forward, the ability to separate and distinguish confidence in our technology and trust in our people uh, will be very closely converged. I think also technical expertise among our warfighters is only becoming more crucial the development of sophisticated warfighting technologies. The information warfare skill sets that are needed today will be more so needed uh, tomorrow. And we need to ensure that our kill chains can work effectively in any command and control and communications environment while grappling with the complicated challenges and unanticipated problems that used to be known as before we had COVID-19. So I think in last, it's always gonna be about the adversary as well, the lens that we approach our daily job and the duties that we must perform. And we must possess knowledge of the adversary's capabilities and attempt surely as they are trying to find out the same about us. And we must undermine their capabilities and their ability to know ours so that we can defeat their decision-making processes uh, and assure ours as well. So I just, uh, it's great to be here and a privilege to be part of this team. Uh, and I look forward to questions and ongoing dialogue. John, back to you and thank you. Great comments. Thank you, Admiral. And, and thank you all for a great opening and, and a lot of information for our participants to think about. As we move to the question and answer portion of the session, a reminder about the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, before we get to the questions from our participants, we've agreed to set the stage by discussing the topics of threats and risks to the remote workforce, impact of this new environment to the mission, unique requirements and capabilities required to be effective in this new environment, and if we have enough time, key lessons learned thus far in the rapid transition to the remote workforce. Our first question about threats and risks is to General O'Brien. And then maybe others want to weigh in. Admiral White, you may have some insight to share based on what you just said about the threat. General O'Brien, from an industry perspective, I can share my experience uh, that I'm in our own cyber threat intelligence organization, Unit 42, uh, re they recently published on malicious attackers targeting government and medical organizations with COVID-19 themed phishing, uh, phishing campaigns which we shared in advance of publication with targeted governments so that they could preposition defenses based on the threat actors indicators of compromise. In fact, during our last JSAC virtual session in May, the CIO for the state of North Dakota reported how his threat surface had changed during the pandemic, stating that SOC incidents requiring investigation spiked from the normal 1500 per week to 7000 per week. And in many cases, employees working from home environments had no firewalls in their modems, allowing access directly to and from the internet, which as you know, is very dangerous as his perimeter was essentially uh, the home environment of each worker. What about the Air Force? Acknowledging the need to protect information that if exposed might provide cyber adversaries with an advantage we'd rather not see happen. What can you share about the new cyber threat vectors and targets that you are seeing and dealing with? Uh, thanks. Um, let me say, uh, in the Air Force, uh, in, especially in the ISR and cyber effects operations enterprise, we're looking at the threats through a couple of different lenses. Um, first, from as you were talking about, from a traditional cyber threat perspective, we're seeing similar malicious activity. Increasing incidents as we grew our telework capacity from a baseline of about 9,000 VPN connections uh, to more than 400,000 VPN connections today. 
Uh, and so the 616th Operations Center at 16th Air Force surged their workforce to monitor those threats, conduct assessments, minimize the risk to the expanding Air Force networks, um, and also employing mitigations to reduce the vulnerabilities. Uh, and I think all of my counterparts uh, would have similar stories about handling those threats. Uh, I'd address a, a second lens to look at the threat right now. This pandemic crisis has made it very, very clear that Russia, China, and others intend to strategically use cyber-enabled information operations against the U.S. They're injecting disinformation, which is not a new concept in itself, but now by incorporating cyber means, they're reaching millions of people um, to exacerbate existing tensions within the U.S. And, and between us and our allies and partners. Uh, for example, these operations include promulgating conspiracy theories and confusing messages about the novel coronavirus, especially when we first became aware of it. Uh, conspiracy theories about the origination, origination of it, uh, the risks, the populations and demographics of the people most at risk, the severity of the illness, um, and also appropriate measures that we should be taking to reduce the spread of the virus. I think our adversaries have made it very clear that this aspect of strategic competition will be enduring. 16th Air Force units are focused on developing tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, and they're looking to identify, expose, and when directed, countering the threat from the state-sponsored disinformation campaigns. Uh, and this is continuing. Uh, I think we'll see it again as we address the racial discrimination um, that we talked about earlier. Uh, and, and finally, the last threat uh, that I'm closely watching is the risk of losing valuable momentum on our cyber initiatives, uh, especially the ones that were tied to the upskilling of not only our existing cyber workforce, but our future workforce and the baseline cyber knowledge that we want all airmen to have, you know, uniformed and civilians. Uh, we have several initiatives that we're partnering with CN um, and other uh, Air Force partners to stand up a digital university so that people can have access to resources um, to improve their cyber knowledge. Uh, also, we're rolling out our computer language initiative, which was a best practice we took from the uh, cryptologic uh, linguist capabilities to provide incentives for people to improve their uh, proficiency. In this case, having them do self-assessments or other types of assessment um, and then paying them to maintain proficiency in different coding languages. Um, and then also we have, uh, we've put together a digital talent management charter working with uh, Air Force Material Command, who has many of the software coders, our workforce, the CN workforce, and things like that. Um, all of these initiatives are critical to our future. Um, and I would say that we really need to be prepared to address all three of those type of threats moving forward in this environment. Thanks for sharing your insight, General. Uh, Admiral White, or would anyone else like to make an additional comment about threats and risks? John, it's uh, TJ, if I might. Um, I, I think uh, the threats uh, continue to be fast, uh, and they appear to be adaptive, and they are emerging at scale uh, and with great reach. And I think the predicate condition for this is, as we found ourselves responding to the COVID-19 demand, both from below, as in the workforce that wanted to get connected, and from above, leadership within the department that also wanted them to be connected. Uh, it required heavy re-engineering on a global scale, and in the case of the Navy, for a network that was never envisioned to operate remotely at that kind of scale. Uh, before, uh, inside our enterprise network, we had only you know single-digit thousands of users that were remoting into the network, and within less than three weeks, that became hundreds of thousands that were removing in uh, and a very proportionally small number that were working from the inside as this point of origin. And so we had to confront some gaps in our training. Uh, we had to take advantage and empower the problem solvers that we had, unfortunately in too few numbers, that understood the mission impacts. Uh, and we had to empower them to be aggressively creative 
in making the changes necessary to flip the network inside out uh, safely and securely. And I think that we've done a very, very good job and we are learning uh, as we go. Uh, but I still don't have the kind of confidence that I want uh, as a maneuver element commander uh, that I can assure it uh, as a point of command and control and circumstances that I can define uh, and see uh, very transparently. So what has the threat done in response to that? I think there's a bunch of open source intelligence. Uh, industry is a big driver of that. So John, to you, and uh, Palo Alto and Unit 42, great example of how you do that. Uh, a lot of OSINT reporting implies that nation states are intending to capitalize on the pandemic from an information warfare perspective. Uh, their TTPs don't seem to be changing at the end point. And I would offer that uh, the malicious cyber activities that I'm following uh, seem to be business as usual with phishing and spoofing. They're just doing it with a very adaptive uh, and very aggressive COVID thing. I would uh, think also that cyber criminals, nation states, and their proxies are using this pandemic for commercial gain as well. Uh, and they are deploying uh, at increased scale uh, a variety of ransomware and other malware. I think that we've seen their ability to take things that are becoming introduced or vetted in public as vulnerability on the path to being closed, they are being weaponized for exploitation and other capabilities very, very rapidly. Uh, and I think I would just close with saying that attacks against this newly and rapidly deployed remote access and teleworking infrastructure, uh, we, we certainly have not seen the last of it. Uh, we are undergoing several pilots inside the DOD right now, to figure out how to do it better and at scale. Uh, all of that is gonna be good from our own organic cybersecurity standpoint is I think we continue to find across cyberspace. Uh, somewhere in there is going to be a vulnerability that we didn't think about, that we don't know about, haven't anticipated, uh, and that will become a future problem for us. Uh, John, thanks for the chance to comment. Thanks, TJ. And uh, just from my perspective, I'll tell you, you know, nothing against the U.S. intelligence community in making this statement, but the cyber threat intelligence organizations out here in industry are really pretty darn good. And I would love to see a better uh, cooperative effort between government and industry on those, those efforts. Okay, our next question uh, is going to deal with the impact of this new environment on the mission. Uh, I was gonna start with General Schwedo. I don't know if he's returned. BJ, have you been able to make it back yet? Sir, uh, Rich Jones here, General, unfortunately, is still in the tank, sir. Okay, then uh, let's take an, another look at the joint environment with uh, Admiral Norton. Uh, uh, take a look at your view of this uh, from, the, from the perspective of both DISA and JFHQ Doden. Uh, last April, uh, the DOD CIO, Dana DC briefed reporters on DOD communication efforts regarding COVID-19 and announced the stand-up of the COVID-19 Telework Readiness Task Force that was comprised of leaders from his office, the DOD CIO's office, Cyber Command, JFHQ Doden, NSA, DISA, the Joint Staff, and the Military Services. I know many of you are on this task force. Mr. DC reported that the task force meets daily to discuss key areas, and he also said that the department has implemented the transition while ensuring mission operational needs are not impacted. What can you share with our audience regarding the impact on the joint mission since April and perhaps given the unique audience that we have with us today, where you might need any assistance from your partners across government, academia, and industry with respect to those seven key areas that the task force is focusing on. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, so I'll tell you that, you know, standing up the task force was incredibly important and, um, and uh, helpful in getting a jump on all of the things that we needed to do by pulling all of the senior leaders together very quickly to identify and prioritize the greatest needs very quickly. So being able to meet together, understand what we needed to work on, what needed to uh, to be done within a service or within a combatant command or what needed help across the joint force. Uh, my assistance from, from DISA and Joint Force Headquarters Doden or uh, assistance from Cybercom and others working together as a team 
made uh, allowed us to get things done very quickly. Um, things that would have normally taken us months, sometimes years to do, we were able to do in days. And, and no kidding, it was amazing how quickly we could get things done. And very innovative solutions in delivering capabilities to our joint warfighters across the board. And um, you know, it, it, it's a crisis, and it's amazing how well you can deliver things in a crisis when everybody's pulling together as a team. And that's exactly what we've been doing all across the board. So, um, so we did that very, very rapidly and working together daily to um, basically just look at what's the next constraint? What is it that we need to deliver and how can we deliver uh, to get more, more people working mo most effectively from home as quickly as possible? So looking at the equipment, um, all about mobility. Uh, you know, what, what kind of government furnished equipment do, do we need to get out there? What are the different, um, different capabilities? How can we deliver that? Are there um, uh, deficiencies in that? That was one area where industry jumped on very quickly, where there's supply chain issues that we needed to worry about and, and was industry working on that? Industry um, knew that from day one on uh, things like laptops, cameras, and and all of those things that uh, you know that were were quickly in demand, just like toilet paper. And you know, laptops and computers became uh, a hot commodity. And and we worked very closely with our industry partners on all of the things that we knew that were going to be in short supply and long lead items. And uh, and very quickly understood where we were going to have problems and where we weren't going to have problems. Um, other parts of uh, you know of that joint effort was in the network and understanding whether or not we were going to have problems. And uh, again, industry jumped on those issues. So um, were there going to be issues in network transport? Telephone trunks, for example. Um, you know, who would have ever thought that we would have such a, a, an amazing demand on telephone overnight in a matter of just a couple of days? Uh, we had had massive increase in telephone trunks and and switches and um, cell phone towers and all of the things that had to happen in order to enable ma major cities to be able to work from home in completely different ways uh, because of course you know what we learned is we all still love meetings right and just because we're all in different places we well what we, we must still love meetings because we still hold them every day, all day long. We just hold them from different ways. And now we're all, you know, all dispersed instead of holding them together. And so we have to have lots of, of uh, transport in order to hold these meetings, whether those over, they're over telephone lines or conference bridges or uh, collaboration tools. And so um, every one of those had to be increased. And so working with industry very rapidly to make sure that all of those were addressed. And we were doing that with DISA and, and with the services and our industry partners to make sure that was taken care of. Um, that was massive work and massive increases and it all happened in a matter of really those first uh, really 10 days to two weeks, massive, massive increases. And after that, it was you know just incremental increases as, as we saw fit where we needed it in uh, very specific places. And, um, and what I would ask from industry and, uh, and others as we go forward is, Continue to do that. Look for where we know that there are, there are uh, deficiencies and um, potential deficiencies, and and put in uh, capability for the future and leave it dark because this is going to happen again. Um, it's there, it certainly will happen if we have another second wave that's even worse than this one, and um, and other kinds of contingencies and uh, you know something similar where we have um, significant additional requirements, but. But as we continue to, to change the way the nation works, not just the Department of Defense, but the nation works, we are going to have more um, requirements. And I think it's important for us to be um, a lot more telework ready, remote work ready. Like Bruce said, it's not remote work, it's not telework, it's just work. And, and we need to have a distributed workforce that can do that. So when we look at our joint operations, we need to be looking at that. How do we work differently uh, across uh, whether that's CONUS or OCONUS and um, tactical forces or strategic forces, where do we work and how and what are the requirements to do that? And um, so, we, you know, we looked across the board, what, what are the requirements and, and where do we need to um, increase capability? And, um, you know, probably the biggest uh, demand for us was um, across the board was the need for mobile um, secure capability, and that that's been the biggest driver for um, you know difficult 
uh, need to fill. And we've done a lot of that to, to make it easier for our, our forces to work from home as well. Thanks, Admiral. I agree with you. You know, it seems to me that, you know, counterintuitively, the work from home environment has resulted in an increase in the number of meetings, not a decrease. But uh, I do want to save some time for Q&A from the audience, but I, I want to put a transition question in here because it's, you touched on a lot of this, Admiral, but I'd like to get a service perspective. I'd like to go to General Crawford. And this is about, you know, uh, focuses on requirements identified to operate effectively in this new evolving environment, as well as the capabilities to meet them. And uh, Bruce, can you please tell us what you're seeing in terms of the urgent requires uh, urgent requirements brought about by the rapid transition to a remote environment? And please, as you started uh, saying up front, don't limit that to just the technical side of things, as you're obviously in a strategic position to assess the changing uh, requirements that may be occurring as a result of institutional culture and norm policies or prior assumptions that are no longer valid. So please, uh, I'll give you the floor. Yeah, yeah John, thanks. I, I think, uh, <clears throat> so first I want to piggyback just a little bit on what Nancy talked about in, in the task force. And if I could just offer one thought, I, I think the, the big idea uh, that I took away from the value of the task force is I think the coming together of not only the CIOs and, and not only bringing, you know, Nancy being a part of it, but also Cybercom and NSA and then the cyber uh, service components. I, I think the big idea associated with that is because we were all looking at the same targets at the same time, it allowed us to anticipate the strategic impact of change by reacting to it. And, and there are countless examples. Uh, thinking about things like we had disabled all the cameras and mics on all the uh, uh, des uh, desktops and laptops in the Pentagon uh, based on a 2018 policy uh, to disable them. But all of a sudden, you've got 90% of the Pentagon and all over the Army leaving their workspace to go home. And all of a sudden, now they got to communicate, well, their cameras and mics have been disabled. And so we were able to get ahead uh, and, uh, of some of those, those type requirements and actually anticipate uh, the impact of that evolution from 1% you know, or so teleworking to all of a sudden 90% for telework. And there are countless other examples like, uh, we're having a discussion about uh, the uh, impact of the threat. So I think one of the most important things that we did early on was the recognition that we had a workforce that was used to operating inside the traditional perimeter and we're about to send them out into the wild of their living room where we're going to have to evolve from defending the perimeter the traditional uh, perimeter to defending the living room one of the most important things we did is the work of nancy's team uh, cybercom and nsa along with the cios there was actually a cyber do's and don'ts document that we put together. And uh, of course we put out a lot of documents. We put out documents all the time. But what this one took into account was we took uh, threat-based uh, intel, uh, threat-based uh, information, and we were able to, I don't know how many iterations we did on that document, we were able to put it into speak that a logistician who worked at pick your location across the country could take home with them and really understand their role uh, in defending the network, their role in defending their endpoint. So that's just a piece of the cyber uh, discussion. Uh, I thought our group was able to anticipate Vice React, and that was a big takeaway from the task force. But also, one of the most important things that we did was to put together that document in plain speak, but it was it allowed us to educate a workforce and uh, to. And I must admit, we're, we were educating a workforce on things that they don't normally think about every, every day and giving them a role in this. So to your question uh, with respect to requirements, uh, I, I, I believe there probably was no greater requirement uh, that's been highlighted every day than the lack of an enterprise uh, collaboration tool. Uh, and so overnight, we literally went from, I'd say, probably almost zero users of the CVR Microsoft Teams capability to where we are right now, where the Army is about 319,000 users. 
I'm projecting at the pace we're on right now, we'll be uh, at about 400,000 users over the next 30 days. So you're going to have almost half the 1.2 million person army operating on a collaboration tool that really didn't exist as an institution uh, over the last uh, no, 90 days ago. It uh, didn't exist as a capability over, over the last 90 days ago. And so we've got countless examples where uh, the need for mobility has been highlighted. And we're at a point now where we can't go back. And so literally our users have seen, you know, the invention of the cigarette lighter. So we can't ask them to continue to rub sticks together when it comes to uh, mobility uh, and, and collaboration tools. And so I, I think uh, there's that. And then Nancy touched on it a bit, uh, but uh, this, this big idea when it came to SIPR, right? So a lot of our workforce are actually, you know, they're, they're, they're SIPR content generators. They're just not reading email. So being able to quickly turn institutionally and corporately to start kicking out and delivering uh, mo mobile uh, SIPR collaboration tools was really a game changer for us, and that's ongoing. And then one of the last things that, that I'll tell you uh, is uh, being able to see ourselves as an organization uh, and identify uh, our, uh, the multiple commercial collaboration uh, 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 solutions for classified tools that we had uh, capabilities that were being developed by all of the services and to then be, in, uh, be able to coalesce around one or two that was the best of breed. Uh, what that's launched is, I'll give an example in the Army, uh, we, we were able, back to this idea that we were able to accelerate some of the ideas that we had, we've moved from, we were probably a year and a half away from this, to in the next 30 days, we're going to have the first 2,000 users uh, start to use our enterprise commercial solutions for classified capability. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, this big idea of our users deserve right now, based on lessons that we've learned, that they can access any data uh, from any device. And so uh, back to this idea that we're not going to look back, it's our job now uh, to decide and think about how we're going to enable that capability, and more importantly and more germane to this conversation, uh, how we're going to secure it. So those are just a couple of thoughts. Uh, I think that eventually, we, we, you know, if we stayed here longer, we'd be having conversations about zero trust and how uh, the, the pilots that have been ongoing uh, with respect to how DOD is going to roll out zero trust attributes and then full capability have been, uh, I'd say, put on the launching pad now. And those, those ideas are now being accelerated. Uh, and so those are just my thoughts. Uh, if you don't remember anything else that I said and the audience doesn't remember anything else that I said, it's the demand for mobility but that mobility has got to be from any device. Because when you are mobile from any device, be it your personal device uh, or your government device, that introduces about 500,000 more users, if, you know, just speaking from an Army perspective, that don't have a government-issued device you know, to take home with them, you know, a, a cell phone uh, or a government-issued uh, laptop. So I just offer that as just a few thoughts in terms of the mission uh, piece of this. Over. Thank you, Bruce. Excellent. Uh, that's very impressive. And yeah, you're right. Zero trust, no longer a nice to have. It's a must have in this kind of environment. Hey, we have a, a question from Andrew uh, Eversden, a reporter with Federal Times uh, for the panel. What efforts do you have underway in case of a second wave of coronavirus? Uh, does anybody, well, I'm sure you all could answer that. Does anyone want to go first? Yeah, we've already been thinking about what's, uh, what's, re what's required. And um, so as we've been looking at all of the choke points, we continue to look at what, what's the next choke point. That's why I say uh, to, with industry, we need you to be telling us what are your next choke points, what, what needs to happen. And we continue to go out to, uh, to all of our components to say, what are your next mission requirements in order to enable even more people to telework, um, not just at the level that you've been surviving, but at a new level of thriving in this, uh, this telework environment, being incredibly effective in, in conducting your mission. Thank you, Admiral. Did, did I hear someone else want to answer that as well? Yeah, John, this is Bruce. Can you hear me? I got you, General. All right, just, just very briefly here in the interest of time. Uh, so, so my 
probably most important partner in all of this from an Army perspective has been uh, my Ranger buddy, Lieutenant General Steve Fogarty and his team. And uh, they, they did a phenomenal job uh, in terms of uh, the rollout of this. You know, things like a 400% increase uh, in, in capacity, uh, allowing things like, you know, if you look at the medical community, 50% of their patient engagements right now are, are in, the, in the virtual space. But as Steve and I took this on, you know, the Army compo uh, component of this, the one thing that we wanted to build into our plan was flexibility. So we didn't box leaders in. Back to this whole idea of new normal vice new now, and we don't know what the next two weeks holds, much less uh, the next six months of this. And so I, I would say probably the one big thing that we did is we built in to the plan as much flexibility to scale as we possibly could. Over. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, uh, understand, that's a, that's a great answer. Uh, as is usual the case, we got a whole lot more questions than we have time. So I'm going to go with the one last question, and it's from my old teammate, Rob Schreier, with Johns Hopkins APL. And he's asking this to General O'Brien first, and then others as they may want to comment. Uh, his question is, uh, you spoke specifically of data. I want to ask you and any other panelists about the potential role you see in artificial intelligence, AI, dramatically increasing our cyber defense decision-making and maneuver in the now normal, where our workforce may, be permanently, may permanently be more dispersed? Yeah, thanks. I, I think that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we uh, realized we had to do um, as we were talking about data and trying to connect data. So, our medical community data needed to be connected to the logistics data. And we had all this stovepipe data. Uh, and a lot of people were offering solutions, both internal to the Air Force and external to the Air Force. Um, and, and we ended up creating a giant spreadsheet to bin these different capabilities. Because what we found is words matter. And, uh, and something that is true, artificial intelligence, um, means something specific. So we had different capabilities. Again, back to I mentioned uh, visualization of data. Um, that's not artificial intelligence. You know, being able to run predefined reports against a certain subset of data. That's not artificial intelligence. Trying to have prediction um, to where the virus would go next and what we need to do to respond to it. It's not artificial intelligence, useful in informs enterprise decision making. Um, and so every time somebody would say, you know, this, this uses AI, we'd say, well, what training data set did you use it and how did you develop the algorithms? And if there was, because this was new, this is a novel coronavirus, there is not a training data set that exists now. In a second wave, we might have that data set that we need that will help us develop those artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, but then the other thing that I'll add to that is, and this is again, um, one of the benefits of bringing our ISR and cyber uh, SMEs together is being able to do a rigorous trade craft to look for bias in the data. Um, because if we develop artificial intelligence algorithms to help us, um, whether it's to help us defend our networks or do other things for us, if that data has bias in it, then our algorithms are gonna be biased. Um, and so again, that links back to some of the initiatives that I really wanna maintain our momentum for our digital university um, to help people understand this difference between um, different ways of using your data and running it through an application. Um, thanks, that, that's a great question. Thanks, General. Does anybody else want to uh, take a stab at that before we move to closing remarks? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah John. Go ahead, Bruce. No, no I, I just think just to add to that, so I, I think all the leaders across the department have recognized kind of one big thing. That one big thing is data really is the ammunition of the future fight. 
uh, leveraging data, uh, in, you know, not in its current state, but in its future state where it's been normalized. It's, vis it's uh, visible, uh, it's accessible, usable, trusted, interoperable, and, and, and protected. Uh, really is a major task that Mr. DC and the team here are taking on. But to uh, the relevance to this particular discussion, uh, I think, uh, so we got a heavily censored network, and I think you know that, and then the audience knows that uh, chapter and verse. But to be able to take advantage of, uh, of uh, efforts like Steve Fogarty's team has with Gabriel Nemes and their big data platform, to actually feed the data that we're collecting into an environment where we really can leverage the true power of AI and ML really is the future state uh, that we're headed for. And that's just some commentary with respect to data. That's a, that's a whole other two-hour session or three-hour session with respect to the process we're going to do uh, to normalize our data so that it's, as the uh, uh, Jake director uh, uh, talks about, that it's clean data, not dirty data, that we're using, uh, putting our AI, uh, AI and ML uh, platforms on top of. But let's offer that as a thought. Over. Thanks, General. Uh, since we've got about uh, eight minutes left, I'd like to issue a challenge to our leaders uh, that they might be able to make some closing comments in about a minute. <laughs> we'll see if you can do that. Uh, we're going to go, you can talk about uh, anything that you missed up front, future outlook, lessons learned, or anything in particular that you think this audience needs to walk away with. Uh, we'll go in reverse order from when we started. We'll start with Admiral White, then General O'Brien, then General Crawford, then General Schwedo if he's back, and we'll end with Admiral Norton. So over to you, uh, TJ. Okay, John, thank you very much on the clock. Uh, two items uh, in closing. Uh, first, uh, to the midshipmen and the cadets, uh, I think your future is very bright. I think you will be uh, confronted with plenty of change, challenge, and uncertainty. And I just want to say now, thank you for volunteering. Thank you for taking the oath. And thank you for your present and future service. Okay, so now that I've given you the aspirational statement, let me tell you why I think you're going to have a lot of fun, but why it's going to be really hard. Uh, I think what we've been talking about here is you need to deliver for us in a very assured and confident, authoritative way, global, mobile, secure, wireless, independent of spectrum and protocol. Uh, you need to do that because in the maneuver dimension where we need to deliver fires uh, across a wide front, it is gonna be about decision to do so. That decision is gonna be driven by data and that data is important as we cross into, if we are called to do so as a department and as a joint force, the lethality boundary. And we need that data to be authoritative, uh, and we need that to be confident, and we need that to be trusted. Uh, John, thank you very much for the opportunity to partner with you uh, and all the flag and general officers on the panel. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. You bet, TJ. Over to you, General O'Brien. Thanks. Um, I would say um, remote working, teleworking is here to stay. Uh, we're not going back. And uh, I'll share uh, one of the ways I know uh, that that's the case. There, there were a lot of naysayers out there that said this would, wouldn't work, you know, productivity would go down. And, and one of the quotes from the most stringent naysayer, he said, I used to believe telework meant I can't tell if you're working. Um, but now he is a 100% convert uh, because this model that we would never have tried um, has now been proven to work. And so we're going to continue to leverage it. We're going to continue to make it better. Uh, we're going to become more comfortable with it, and our workforce is going to come to expect it. Um, and when I mentioned the loss, my concern about the loss of momentum, I failed to give our Air Force cyber workforce the credit they deserve. They moved mountains in a short amount of time so that this could happen. Um, the entire Air Force was counting on their ingenuity and innovation to make sure we could respond to the needs um, to support US uh, Northcom with their COVID-19 assistance efforts. We continue to push airmen and aircraft out the door to support CENTCOM in their AOR. Uh, we supported the timelines that are associated with the standup of the US Space Force, which is our secretary's number one priority right now, as well as the rest of her priorities. Um, they delivered the capabilities we needed to do all of that and more and I could not be more proud of them. Um, I really have enjoyed listening to my peers. I've taken away several great ideas back with me, um, and this might even be a great venue for us to do uh, on our own. 
Um, and so uh, would be happy to have TJ set that up for us again. Uh, thanks again for hosting a great event. It, it was really spectacular. Great, I share your pride. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, General Crawford, over to you. John, John, thanks again to, to, to you and the, uh, the team for, for pulling this together. Very, very quickly, quick message to uh, the cadets and midshipmen. Listen, I, I am envious. Uh, although there will be a great challenge, I'm envious of, of the journey uh, that you uh, had ahead. I just offer uh, just one thought for you with respect to that journey and, and the importance of leadership in that journey. I, I think the, the major, the, the significant difference between what you are going to have to do and what the you know, generals and leaders and corporate leaders from industry, et cetera, uh, have to do every day is that you're going to be faced with the challenge of not only leading the soldier, the sailor, the airman, and the marine, uh, you're going to be faced with the challenge of leading the person. Uh, and all the things that actually uh, come comes with that. Uh, I would just close by saying, John, we talked about a lot of things today, uh, but there's one other thing that's looming out there, and it's called the people problem, all right? And, and having the trained and ready workforce that's going to be required uh, to, to take on these monumental tasks. I think if Dana D.C. Were, were here, he would say, and I agree with him, we had a good discussion about this, the center of gravity for all of this, okay, it's actually the workforce. And the people. And so at another time, I'd like to come back and talk about the Army's effort, and it's called Quantum Leap. And it really is about reimagining the workforce of the future, taking advantage of what we've learned uh, in this last 90 days with respect to the importance of online training and the significance of being able to capitalize on online training and nano degrees and shifting away from a focus on certifications to a focus on skills the skills that we're going to need in the next three to five years. So I close again by saying thank you, and I really appreciate the opportunity. A lot of notes taken here. Uh, great information exchange. Army strong. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, couldn't agree more. It's always about the people. Uh, let's see if General Schwedo survived the tank meeting and made it back. BJ, did you make it back? Sir, it's Rich Jones. Uh, he did not make it back, sir, but very quickly we focused on uh, department, the joint force and services. Just one very quick point. We've also had good success with our international allies and partners. We recently had a meeting with our Five Eye Nations, so five different countries, over 50 participants. They're also challenged with COVID, and we had an awesome two-day meeting with them. So really no impact uh, across the joint uh, mission sets, but also no impact to our international and allied partners. So uh, uh, it's, we're moving things forward. On behalf of General Schwader, sir, we really appreciate the opportunity to engage today. Some great lessons learned here too, sir, and uh, Semper Fi. Out here, sir. Well, thank you very much. And please pass on our thanks to uh, General Schwedo. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was wondering myself about the impact on our interoperability and uh, partner and allied partnerships that we have around the world with all these countries essentially going into self-isolation. It's good to hear that we were able to maintain those relationships. Uh, Admiral, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate you uh, putting this together. Um, I'll tell you, the key lesson learned in going forward is that we have to be mobile ready. We are a mobile DOD workforce, and we are a mobile uh, a, a war fighting force. We have to be mobile ready with our devices, with our capabilities, with our applications, with access to our data, and with our processes. And I think that's one thing that we didn't talk about. Our processes have to evolve to do this as well. We have to go paperless. We were supposed to do that in the 90s. We're finally having to do that because we can't push paper around when we're not together to touch the paper. So we have to figure out how to stay connected as people, um, even though we're not physically together. And we can do this with the same kind of innovation um, uh, skills and um, desire that we have for all of the technology. We can innovate to change the way we do business in, in this new, um, new, new world that we're living in based on, on COVID. I think it's really an accelerant for a lot of the things that we wanted to do anyway. We have an agile and resilient workforce in the DOD and um, certainly DISA and Joint Force Headquarters Doden have demonstrated that and we will continue to do that. We've shown that we are stronger and better than ever. And I think that we are leading the government and leading the nation in, in showing that we can do exactly what we need to be doing, um, delivering on on our responsibility to defend the nation, despite the fact that we are, uh, are, are living in very difficult times. And um, we, we have no desire to go back 
we will go forward in new ways of doing things in this mobile world that we live in. And um, the Marines have always said that every, every Marine is a rifleman. I've been saying for years that every DOD member is a cyber defender. So for the, the cadets and the midshipmen, remember that you are a cyber defender as you go forward every day in every way and particularly in a mobile workforce that you're gonna be living in. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing what you're gonna do with this mobile workforce that we are built for you. Thank you. Well said, Nancy, powerful comments. Uh, well, this has been another fantastic session. I'd like to thank all of our distinguished panel members, as well as Nikesh and General Silveria for their leadership today. We also appreciate the commitment, tremendous support from all of our participants as always. We value these summits as a very unique venue for exchanging ideas and building trusted relationships between public and private sectors to pursue solutions to the challenges that our nation, fa our nation faces in the cyber domain. In the coming days, we'll be communicating additional virtual session opportunities on other important topics. We thank you again. Please remain safe, healthy, productive during this uh, tough time for the country. Oh, and one more thing. In the high hopes that our military academies will have a football season this coming fall, well, I'll just leave it right there. Go Army. Please take care, everyone.